All right, I think we are good to go. Cool. I, I'm trying to figure out two better ways to start. This. Yeah. Hi. Hi. Oh wait, let me do an intro. <laughs> 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 Welcome to the Massage Hodge podcast. My name is Nick Paterka, a licensed massage therapist here in the Portland, Oregon area, and I am joined by Crystal Kalunka, a fellow licensed massage therapist. Say hello. Hello. Awesome. So glad to have you here. Thank you for having me. Uh, tremendous. So um, I met you at a class yep. at East West College, Correct. Uh, where it turns out that you're a teacher, although yes. I only know that recently. We'll get to that. <laughs> sure. And it was an amazing boundaries class with yeah. Sarah Davis. Continuing education Continuing class. education class. Mm-hmm. Thank you. Um, but you are a practitioner in town. Correct. Yeah. And I thought maybe to begin, you could give uh, the, the audience, as it were, mm-hmm. a little background on how you came to oh, be a sure. massage therapist and what your practice looks like now. Yeah, happy to do that. Um, it's a bit of a story. So, um, I love a story. Right. I definitely did not grow up exposed to massage therapy at all. Um, I grew up with, in, in a blue-collar, like, farming, steel-working community um, where touch was a little complicated, mm. you know, like side hugs. I come from side huggers, oh, right? Okay. <laughs> Um, and so I just didn't know anything about massage therapy. Um, and I was working on my undergraduate degree in cultural anthropology and archaeology. Okay. In Northwest Montana, University of Montana, Missoula. To become Indiana Shout Jones. Out. Right, exactly. How did you know? <laughs> um, spoiler alert, it's nothing like Indiana Jones. <laughs> um, and I was doing a lot of mountaineering at that point in time. Um, and I had an accident, I had a mountaineering accident, Glacier oh. National Park, oh. and um, blew out my posterior cruciate ligament in my right knee. Wow. Uh huh. Coming down off of an ascent, it was really scary. Um, made it off the mountain, um, and then couldn't hardly walk, right? So I went to three different doctors, um, and in this story, I'm only like 22 years old. Okay. Right, so I go to three different doctors. Every single one of them is like surgery, surgery, surgery. And I didn't know a lot about surgery or the body at that point in time, but I felt like that was awfully young for my first knee mm-hmm. surgery. Yeah. Also, I thought it was so weird that all of these doctors had assessed me, but not a single one had actually touched my knee. Yeah, curious. Right? Which I now know, you and I both know, the industry term for that is palpation, mm-hmm. right? I didn't know that term, but I thought, gosh, this is so strange. Right, that they've imaged it, that they've handed me pamphlets, that they've looked at it from across the room. Yeah. But nobody had actually manipulated the tissue. Huh. Right. So I spoke to a friend who was a downhill skier, and this friend was like, You should go see my massage therapist. Okay. And I thought, well, that's weird. <laughs> I was like, what kind of voodoo what? magic is this? Exactly. I was so skeptical. Yeah. I was so very skeptical, but I tried it <clears throat> and it changed my life. So working that's with great. this massage therapist helped me understand that I had a lateral patellar tracking issue Okay. in that leg, right? So we worked that out, got the kneecap back into its spot. It mm-hmm. alleviated a ton of the pressure in the joint. Um, and so I was like, cool, I'm great, right? Mm-hmm. But then I was thinking about starting a doctorate program in my line of work, and I was accepted into one, and then it was time to start it, and I kept kicking the can down the road Mm. and not starting it. And I thought, gosh, this is something, like, maybe I don't want to do that. Maybe I don't want to pursue that degree in that direction. So I found myself getting more massage. Oh. Mm Mm-hmm. So what I did is I had had this understanding of massage at this point is very medical-focused, Um, But all of a sudden, it became this critical tool and helping me navigate some big life choices Mm -hmm. and some identity issues, um, some emotional stuff, um, and I fell in love with it. And then it was my partner at the time who was really being patient hearing me talk about, I don't know what I want to do, what I want to do. And he was like, hey, you know what? Every single potluck we go to or barbecue that we go to, you tell anyone who wants to hear you say, hey, have you thought about a career in massage therapy? Because my <laughs> massage therapist seems like she's got it pretty well figured out. <laughs> and he was like, you know, I really think you're probably talking to yourself. Yeah. Right? And I was like, huh. 
Well, no, that's not true. At first, I was like, you don't know me. <laughs> you don't know me. And I was like, oh, wait, you do. I'm totally yeah. talking to myself. So I took a year off of everything. Call it my Hallmark movie year. Okay. I worked at a French bakery. Yes. Le Petit Outre in Missoula, Montana. Shout out. It's All a great right. place. <laughs> Everyone loves you when you're selling them chocolate croissants. Was there like a corporate building coming in next door who was going to destroy? The- <laughs> <laughs> Not yet. Okay. Thank God. <laughs> no, there was a That bre- would be true Hallmark. There was a brewery next door, oh, so okay. that was pretty symbiotic. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> um, but I, I spent a year just asking myself literally like what I wanted a day in my life to look like. Mm-hmm. And I started arriving at these these big concepts of like, I want to be in service to people. I want to help people feel better. I also did not want to work 40 to 60 hours a week mm-hmm. for like a corporate entity. Um, I'm very entrepreneurial. I knew that that was going to be part of it. I'm also fascinated in, with cultures and the overlap of cultures. Mm-hmm. And body work certainly has like a broad um, area of content for that. And so by the end of that year, I was like, yeah. That's what I'm going to do. Wow. I'm going to go to massage school. Um, so, yeah, that's how I fell into it. That's amazing. Thanks. I And the first episode of the show, I talk about how I don't have a cool story <laughs> and, <laughs> and how I've always been really self-conscious about it. And, Nick, it's never too late to go leave your kneecap on a mountain. <laughs> <laughs> I don't want to do that. I was just like... It just kind of came up, and I was like, yeah, oh, that sounds interesting. And I went to East yeah. West College, and it was awesome. Well, you know, that's yeah. an interesting thing, too, about living in Portland. So, I mean, I guess I'm a little biased because I'm a graduate of East West, and I teach there. But um, I have a lot of respect for that institute. Yeah. It's actually how I ended up in Portland. D- going to that school. Yes. Yeah. When it was time for me to study, I did a deep dive, and I wanted a really excellent educational experience. Yeah. Um, and so, yeah, like I went for that school. But what I tell a lot of people is if you already live in Portland, maybe you don't know. Like how great it is. Yeah. yeah. And that's okay. And that's okay. I just, yeah. I was just like, that's the one you go to. It is. What, like I did zero research. Right. Yeah. yeah. I was like, that's the one I went to. Well, so how fortunate you are yeah. that like you happen to live in the same town. as <laughs> Right. <it. laughs> yeah, for yeah. sure. So that's the origin story. Yeah. What does your, I, I wrote some notes cause I, yeah, sure. I Googled. Oh, you, you researched. Yeah. <laughs> okay. Your style is a mix of deep tissue. Uh huh. Sweetest relaxation. Uh huh. Thai, uh-huh. craniosacral, yep. tweena. Uh-huh. It's a little bit of a hodgepodge. Oh, yeah, indeed it that? is. Yeah. And, you know, I would even add a uh, polarity to okay. that as well. I've studied polarity yeah. quite a bit since, since that, that bio. Since that was written. Mm-hmm. Yeah, yeah, with Linda Hunt. She's incredible. She was my first teacher, first class, first teacher. Me too. Really? Yes. She was incredible. Oh, absolutely. Yeah. I feel I so fortunate. Sort of like to complete that, the East-West, or to continue the East-West yeah. training, I was keep needing to go get work from her Mm -hmm. because she does polarity and energy absolutely yeah she has a gorgeous office in southwest portland yeah it's a whole experience i gotta go you have to yeah Mm -hmm. but was she talking the podcast we'll see (laughs) i mean you know what's cool about her is she does all this shamanic work oh yeah which would be really neat to talk to her about oh that's cool yeah all right file that under under the uh umbrella of Mm -hmm. things to follow up on yeah um what else did you find out about me (laughs) <laughs> <laughs> well, I've, I've met you at the, yeah. at the, at the, class. At the class. Yeah. And I think, uh, we, we know that we're both, uh, single parents. Yes, yes. absolutely. Uh, me perhaps more recently. Sure. Yeah. I was just divorced at the end of December. So I'm still kind of like yeah. navigating this absolutely. new life. Absolutely. The new normal. Yes. Yeah. Um, and it's not easy. It's so, <laughs> so hard. Yeah. There's a lot that goes into it, and yeah, I really decided is. to simultaneously fire up the Massage Hodgepodge sure. as a as a brand, as yeah. sort of a uh, a mission, yeah. and a clinical practice. Yeah, I um, think there's something so powerful about harnessing that energy of transition. Yeah, even if you feel, I mean. I don't know if this is true for you, but even if you feel like you're backed into a corner or you're in a free fall or whatever metaphor of that. Can one be backed into a corner and free falling at the same time? I feel like that was definitely my experience. (laughs) (laughs) Um, But there is, right, like an energy to that. Um, It's not a bad time to create a thing. Yeah. Yeah. And so that's where this is coming from um, right now. Yeah. So I feel like since we met Uh in a boundaries class. Yeah. Um, wonderfully taught by Sarah B. Davis. Davis. Yep, does she Sarah. keep the B? She one? does. Yeah. Absolutely. Um, and it was incredible. Yeah. Um, we should talk about boundaries oh, and how you, I mean, it could be, Yeah. 
I, I really do. I want to get like little round tables. Yeah. Where we just, we pick a specific boundary yes. or ethical issue, and there's Deep like dives. there's like three or four people yep. around the table, all kind of coming at it. Absolutely. I think that would be really fun. Yeah. But just maybe as a as a global perspective. Yeah. Um, setting boundaries and, yep. and keeping them and. Yeah. Uh, this is one of my absolute favorite topics. So something that I tell my students is that what you learn in becoming a massage therapist is also going to change you as a human being across the board, mm -hmm. right? Especially the boundary work, mm -hmm. right? Like the boundary work that we learn in our profession has a ripple effect into every relationship we have, um, including parenting, mm -hmm. right? And like how we do life. So I feel very grateful for that training. I feel like I have this incredible toolkit that I wish everyone had. Mm -hmm. Right. Um, yeah, that's my first, just my first take on it. And I guess it, it helps you not just set boundaries with your, your therapeutic relationships, mm -hmm. but it, it comes over into oh, yeah. your student relationships. Absolutely. Your, everything. Yeah. College, Negotiating college, yeah. contracts. Oh. In the business world, like everything, just having like a very clear understanding, a not chart, like a non-emotional, uncharged understanding of like, this is my boundary. Yeah. Right. Um, Cause I don't know about you, but like, so when I first started massage school and they were like, we're going to talk about boundaries. I literally was like, I don't know what that is. Oh yeah. Literally. Yeah. This concept had never even been presented to me. Right. Right. Um, and so when I first started practicing it, it was often like really fraught and emotional work, mm -hmm. right? Like setting a boundary and holding it. Uh, but the more I did it and the more I've done it in my life, it's really become easier every, I don't want to say it's easy, but like easier every single time. Can you think of any example where you've had to reinforce <sighs> a set boundary? Oh, Just sure. Let's talk about clients. Sure. Yeah. Okay. So some of the areas where I think boundary work comes up a lot is around like no call, no shows, and also clients who are often late. Okay. Right. And so one of the policies in my business is that when you book, let's say an hour massage with me, that's an hour of my time. Mm -hmm. Right. And so I definitely um, had developed early on in my career this client base that was really used to being able to show up 15 minutes late and then having the massage extend 15 minutes beyond the end of that hour long container. Mm -hmm. Because in the beginning I was slow and I didn't have a bunch of clients. Mm -hmm. Right. And so we really got, and then I started to get busier and this became incredibly complicated and problematic. And so I really had to like set that boundary and be like, listen, this is the beginning time and the end time of the massage. Um, and when I started enforcing that boundary, I mean, understandably so, I lost some clients yeah. who had become really used to the way it was before. And that was emotional work for me. It was painful to go yeah. like, okay, I have to really work on this, but I also have to like give that gift to myself. Right. Right. Of like, this is the container of the time. Yeah. Yeah. And then I have like, we don't have to go into this right now, but I also have big feelings about um, boundaries being too permeable leading to burnout. Like we always talk about burnout in our field and people yeah. tend to frame it as just the physical, right? Yes. Like your body gives out, which is something we have to, you know, pay attention to. But in all the years I've been doing this, which is like 14 years, the majority of burnout I have seen is due to hyper permeable boundaries. Huh. People start to feel it's energetic burnout. Absolutely. Yeah. They start to feel, um, taken advantage of not valued, um, super stressed out and then it's really hard to do the work from that place. Right. So really like when I was saying boundaries, it's like giving that gift to yourself. So true. Yeah. Yeah. I think it's Brene <clears throat> Brown also speaks really one. I don't yes. know if you know the author of Brene Brown. Of course. Yeah. 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 I huff her stuff. <laughs> I decided so this year I just was like, I'm just going to read all of them. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, just to do some of that self work and just, yep. I just started. Is it, she, she has a book, is it called The Gift of Imperfection? It's one of her smaller books. Uh, yes. It's phenomenal. She, there, if you look at her website, she recommends her, because she's a lot of work. Yep. She recommends she you go in a certain order if you're yeah. new to her stuff. So I, yeah. Yeah. Cool. Well, I think The I'm Gift the, of Imperfection is my favorite. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. I haven't gotten to that one yet. I well, think I'm on <laughs> Rising Strong, maybe. I can't remember yep. which one I'm on. They're, they're all good. Yeah. Yeah. But she talks about, not in that, the book, Ring. I saw a video of it, but she mm -hmm. talks about how setting boundaries are it's an act of generosity for the people around exactly. you. Exactly. Yeah. It's a kindness to everyone involved. Yeah. 
and so part of ambiguity, yeah, it's right. And part of learning yeah. about boundaries is understanding that like you aren't responsible for the other person's emotional response, mm. right? Mm-hmm. You're really not. And once that becomes clear, um, it makes it a lot easier for me. You know, I can set a boundary and a client or somebody can be disappointed, but I'm not responsible for managing that disappointment yeah. right? or fixing it or removing it. Yeah. Yeah. Well, there's so much Tough to love. say about boundaries. Tough love. Yeah. Yeah. I think we'll wait for the round table to get into more. Like, yeah. Now specific. my clients are going to listen to this podcast and they're going to be like, she is horrible. <laughs> <laughs> Never. They'll be like, she's even better than we imagined. I know. Or they're going to so be like, She's so generous oh. with her boundaries. Right, totally. <laughs> she's so kind to everyone with these yeah. boundaries. <laughs> yeah. Um, well, since you brought it up in terms of like the uh, boundaries can, a lack thereof can lead to burnout. Uh, yes. Something I like to ask every, every, I've done all of one or mm-hmm. two interviews before this. Yeah. So <laughs> we'll hey, call it every. Every. What I'm seeking to ask all other body workers that come on the show is about longevity. Yeah. Particularly people who. Oh, I love this topic. Who have. I love this. I just read more a, than t- 10 years. I just read field. a really great research paper on this topic oh, where tremendous. they specifically interviewed massage therapists who had been employed or had been working as LMTs for it was either seven years or 15 years or longer. Okay. Right. Um, and they did this research study and it came back with like four areas that they highlighted were necessary for longevity. And I'm not going to remember all four right now. <laughs> we will right? find, we'll find, we'll it. find the article I'll send and it we'll to link you. to it. It's so good. It's through the international journal of, uh, body work and massage research, okay. which is my favorite. Yeah. Um, Very thorough peer reviewed yeah. research resource. Uh, but they interviewed these therapists, and, and it came back that um, one of them was excellent continuing education, right? You have mm. to stay curious, and you have to continue to learn. Mm-hmm. I believe one of them was boundaries in business training, mm-hmm. right? So you avoid that burnout. And then one of them, and this one was really fascinating to me, and it, it kind of speaks to what we're doing today, uh, professional connections, Ah. Uh. Right. Yeah. Was critically important for a longevity of a career. Yeah. Um, and I couldn't agree with that more. Yeah. 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 That's, that is sort of a, call it a selfish reason behind a lot of what I'm doing with massage yeah. hodgepodge is yeah. to, is to create that in person yes. network. So much of what we do is like isolated. Very. Yeah. Yep. Just, exactly. Yeah. I like to say I work in a quiet room with one person at a time, not speaking all day. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I can get a little yeah. isolated. Yeah, a little bit. I like stumble out of my office at the end of the day like an owl blinking. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. To to that end, in addition to the like on the mic round tables, I also want to have uh, some off the mic round I think tables. That's really where, important too. Where the um, we can be vulnerable and yeah, share. Yeah, can get a little bit more clear about yeah. some. Issues and I like that frankly. idea. Uh, the ethics class that I teach yeah. for CEs is actually about how to recover from mistakes. Okay. Right? Because Like hurting someone on the table? Is that a mistake? Maybe that or possibly, a boundary mistake. Or like a boundary mistake or just anything, right? Or like um, accidentally saying something that offends a client. Oh, I see. You know, but when these things happen, it's really easy to just shove them down and not look at them, especially because we work so isolated um but there's a whole skill set around Mm. shame management Mm -hmm. right and like taking a look at mistakes or infractions and um transmuting them into growth Mm. um, which is an interesting topic for me so i like to talk about that and that requires off the mic vulnerability yeah 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 sounds like sorry everyone i'm I'm not gonna i'm not gonna tell those stories on the mic today (laughs) (laughs) i have to take you have to take your ethics class now right yeah all right. Oh, so I meant to follow back. Yeah. That article you referenced. Yes. Does it even mention body mechanics? That's what everyone's like. To avoid burnout, that is make such sure. Such a good question. Make sure you're, you know. I can't remember. Leaning into the, you know, make sure you, you're yeah. using your elbows and not Listen, your fingers. Listen, it's really possible yeah. that it does, okay. and it just. You would that, think that would be at least be one of them. It but could it'd be have, really interesting if it wasn't. It could have, but definitely the other parts that I just highlighted for you. I was so happy to read those. Yes. Because I think they need more discussion. So it's possible the article yeah. talks about body mechanics, but I really zeroed yeah. in on um, this, what is actually literally a more holistic approach. Yeah. Right. Well, so much of the conversation about um, longevity is around body mechanics. Right. <laughs> like, Which is just, important. Of yes. Of course. Yes. Like it is definitely part of it, but maybe if we were going to like make a, 
a pie chart uh-huh. of career longevity. In my opinion, you know, body mechanics wouldn't be more than 25% yeah, of that. And that, that might fair. even be a generous yeah. estimate. It's important. It has to be there. But, oh, my gosh, there's so many other issues Yeah. beyond the body mechanics. Yeah. For sure. So there's something I want to ask you about. Okay. Many things. Okay. Um, we mentioned that you're a teacher at East West yeah, College. I am. That you have children. I do. Um, that you have a private practice. I do. Um, we spoke off mic ahead of time that you uh-huh. also do mentorship and consulting. I do. Okay. That's a lot of things. I'm so busy. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> busy is good. You seem fulfilled uh-huh. with the things that are going on in yeah. your life. Yeah. Talk to me about balance. Oh, sure. Yeah. And I don't like, I don't like to talk. Oh no, I'm happy. I like No, this no, like I, I, in the first episode, which as of our recording hasn't come out yet, the first interview, I should say. Yeah. Um, Janelle Woodleaf and I speak about work-life balance and how, sort of how that yep. concept is broken. So I just yep. feel like I shouldn't even use that word anymore. But Which word? Work-life balance, the phrase. Like, yeah, yeah, yeah. But, well, so, it's, but it's just, right up there with like hashtag self-care Sunday. Yeah. Right? Yeah. These things have been a little co-opted and yeah. become a little complicated. And um, we're going to talk about quote unquote self care in a little bit too. Also one yeah. of my favorites. I have so many thoughts about that. <laughs> so um, just life balance, like balancing yeah. all these things that you're up to. Yeah, yeah. So yeah, I'm a single mom. My kids are eight and ten. Mm-hmm. Um that keeps me very, very busy. Um I also have all of these different work identities. Um but <clears throat> a skill that I learned a long time ago from a mentor of mine that really helped things for me in terms of work life balance is the idea of reverse scheduling. Mm -hmm. Do you know this idea? I I don't. I can't claim to. So the basic idea here is that when we, let's say you're going to look ahead at next month's schedule. It's time to like plan out your schedule. We tend to look at the calendar and put in first all of our responsibilities, right? Right. Work here, you know, birthday parties to take kids to here, like this, that, this, that, that. And then when it comes time to schedule anything fun for you or relieving for you, um, the idea is, well, maybe I'll get to it. Maybe. Okay. Around the things. And so reverse scheduling is actually looking at your calendar and going, okay, well, what do I want a week in my life to look like? And mm-hmm. then holding space for fun and joy mm-hmm. and stress relief. Also, um, I have a great therapist. I, I really believe that therapy, talk therapy, mm-hmm. is um, a helpful self-care tool for us yeah. as well. And my therapist has been a huge support in that, saying, like, you know what? You're a single mom. Like, you need to make sure that you have fun sometimes. Mm-hmm. Um, and I guess sometimes maybe we need people to give us permission to do that. Right. So, okay, whoever's listening, I'm giving you permission. <laughs> you all have permission. I'm giving you permission to do that. Because you do. You need to have fun. Yeah. And something I think a lot about with massage, because this is such a fascinating job, right? Yeah. It's it's different than anything else. Um, my feeling about it is that I have a source flame, uh-huh. almost like a pilot light okay. or something. Um, and that has to be lit and active in order for me to do this work. Yeah. And if I'm not careful, if I don't protect that source flame, if it gets low... If it gets snuffed out, I literally cannot massage people. Right. I can't. I can't make myself do it. I mean, for example, um, the first six months after my separation from my marriage. Oh, I'm sorry, I'm touching my mic. Let's it's say okay. that again. Yeah. So for the first six months after the um, separation from my marriage, I, I couldn't massage people because that source flame was really diminished. Hmm. And I just needed some time to build it back up. Yeah. So the self-care component I take really seriously. Yeah. Um, I'm also a big believer in creating almost like a Rolodex. Well, maybe people don't know what those are anymore. <laughs> uh, a toolkit. Uh. <laughs> <laughs> I feel like so often now when like, I'm teaching, digital, I just age myself. What's the digital version of a Rolodex? <laughs> totally. like, uh, Rolodex? Yeah. Is that a watch? No. <laughs> um, having some sort of a toolkit of things that you know that you enjoy to do, 
already selected because uh-huh. something else that will happen to me if I'm not really good about reverse scheduling is I'll get um, an unanticipated amount of time dropped in my lap, like two hours or four hours. And then I just panic. Oh. And I'm like, what do I do? What do I do? Yeah. What do I do? What do I do? And so I think it's really important to cultivate a or little your, list. Your, your, uh, I don't know, like you get that, that chunk of time and you feel obligated to go do something Right, that you know? too. Yeah. And you know what? That list of stuff you have to do, it never goes away. Yeah. And so, you know, maybe be kind to yourself so that you're less cranky about it. So about reverse scheduling, yeah. is the idea to literally put in mm-hmm. the time, like be like... Literally. Literally. Right in the blocks yep. on your calendar that says like yep. whatever the thing is. And sometimes it can look like this, and I'm a fan of doing this, is I will leave a two to four hour, ideally a two to four hour block somewhere in my week, every single week where I just don't have anything planned. Mm. I don't know. Oh, me too. I don't know what I'm going to do with it until it shows up, but it's there. Right. And this is really fascinating for me about this. When I first started doing that, the universe just went hard in the paint on that. (laughs) <laughs> I would just get phone calls from people I hadn't heard from in forever. And they, oh, would, nice. they would literally be like, what are you doing Thursday at 2 p.m.? <laughs> and I'd be like, I don't know, but I'm not making plans. It was so weird. Yeah. yeah. Um, I had to really defend the boundary Yeah. of that. Um, so that's been really helpful. And then I also challenge myself to make time every week for the other things that work well for me, which is yoga um, in the winter here in Portland, Oregon, it's so cold and rainy. I like to go to the sauna, things like that. Mm-hmm. I just try to build it in. Let me paint a little scenario for you. Sure. Um, because this kind of thing is top of mind for me. Yeah. You've, I don't, do you ever have clinical hours on the same day that you teach? Oh, sometimes I try to avoid it, okay. but abs- today, let's Im- today actually is Let's imagine days. a day you have, um, a notably draining client yep. for whatever reason. Yep. You mm-hmm. have a, a challenging student interaction in class. Never happens. <laughs> <laughs> I'm just kidding. And, and then at the end of that day, you have to be present with your kids. Oh. This kind of, like right now while I'm oh, building this. Oh, you're going to shoot an arrow right at my heart. I know. Like totally. I'm with, I'm like, yeah. I'm with the kids. Yes. I'm, my, I have two boys, but I'm not with them. Totally. I'm not with them. So yeah, I know. This happens to me sometimes. Yep. It happens to me more often than I yep. would like to admit. Yeah. So cultivating a toolkit yeah. to be present. I'm th- I feel mm-hmm. like I'm getting a little better yeah. every it's, day at it. This is a reality of the work that we do. Yeah. You know, I talk about it a lot in terms of bandwidth. Mm-hmm. I only have so much bandwidth in a day. Mm-hmm. Right? And like sometimes that runs low. And sometimes that means that you know, my kids don't get the best version of me at the end of a day. Um, and I certainly don't have an answer for this, but I can tell you, I guess, my opinion I about would, it, what's yeah. worked for me. Um, what's worked for me is just being really honest with my children and modeling it yeah. instead of trying to hide it. Yeah. So um, I'm not particularly interested in showing my kids um, a one-dimensional version of an adult. Right. Right. I actually want to see them see me struggle and work through it, uh-huh. right? And so, and they're they're a little bit older now. They're eight and ten, so it's getting easier to have these conversations with them. Yeah. But I'll just tell them, I had a very big, tough, long day, right? I might sound a little grumpy. I might sound a little checked out, but like that's what's happening for me. Um, and that's been incredible because then we have this like whole dynamic together. And a lot of times they'll end up like helping me make dinner oh, or something sweet. like that. And I guess for me, where I find some grace for myself, which that's really important. Right. Right. Finding some grace for yourself is in the idea that I'm really trying to model for them. Because, you know, it's going to happen to them someday. Mm -hmm. You know, whether they have kids or not, you know, they're going to have a day like that. And hopefully they're going to remember how I talked about it with them and it's going to normalize it. Yeah. Yeah. So much more valuable than trying to, you know, create the... The veneer of everything's okay and yeah, a Pinterest childhood yeah. is not really and my because specialty. There's no level of of like charm that you can layer on top of that difficult no, day no. that they won't see through. Exactly. Yeah. It's just gonna come across as so inauthentic. Yeah. Right? They understand. They are so sensitive, those little Buddhas that are yeah. our children, <laughs> right? Like they feel everything. They know what's going on. Yeah. They don't even need language. I mean it's 
like 14% of human communication is verbal. All the rest of it, like they're picking up on all of it. So why not be honest with them? Right? That's what's going on today. Dad's tired. (laughs) And I'll say something like, I'm so glad you're here. I'm so glad we're together. But I'm I'm pretty tired, you guys. Yeah. Yeah. That's good. Yeah. So I feel like we've been dancing around um, just because it blends in so well with with um, all of the stuff, self care. Yeah. Which you mentioned the whole like hashtag self care Sunday and it is is become um, a very loaded term. This is a, a a recurring topic on this show. Yeah. And my feeling is that it shouldn't be the things that you do or right. the things that you buy. Yeah. It should be a state of mind. Yeah. And an approach to life. Totally. So a mindfulness. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Yeah. A mindfulness that it's okay to have joy and happiness and rest. Mm-hmm. Right? I mean, I have so many feelings about this. The first being that I think American culture in general across the board is obsessed with productivity or at least the appearance of productivity. Right. So how many conversations have we all gotten into where I could run into you and be like, Nick, what's going on? And you'd be like, I'm so busy. Right. I did this. I did that. I did this. And then I'm going to say to you, totally, I'm also so busy. And mm-hmm. then what are we even talking about? Right. Right. Because we're trying to place our value on yeah. this productivity spectrum. Do you still catch so yourself false. pulling still. the busy card? Absolutely. And is it just, has it become easier? I do the same thing. Has it become easier for us? Like, yeah. I'm like, what am I going to do? Go into how really, t- you know? Like, well, sometimes I do. Sometimes yeah. people are like, how are you? And I just tell them honestly, and then yeah. they're shocked. <laughs> usually, usually I pull that with a complete stranger. Yeah. Yeah. Like, totally. like a Trader Joe's. Like, right. oh, how's, do you find everything you need? How is yeah. everything? And you're honestly, like, it's not good. Yeah. Totally. You're like, I'm looking into the void. <laughs> I'm that close. <laughs> And they're like, here's your peanut (laughs) (laughs) M&M. I hope they help you. Uh, Um, Yeah, so so this concept and obsession of productivity, I think, is very dangerous. Yes. Um, And so, like, first I look at it from that standpoint. Also, um, yeah, I think self-care should be reframed in terms of, like, Mm self-compassion. Right? Um, Also, so, all right, I heard this metaphor years ago. I think it might have been Brene Brown. Someone. She has is, so this, many great ones. Yeah, this yeah. is not my metaphor at okay. point. And I'm also probably going to get it a little bit wrong, but here we go. Somebody was writing about Thoreau and how Thoreau, Henry David Thoreau, yes. had talked about the mighty chicken. So bear with me. Okay. <laughs> He's like the majestic chicken, which I love chickens. So I was like, okay. He's like, here's this animal that like once a day create, lays an egg, which is literally like a marvel of nature, the most perfect protein packaged for us, all ready to go. It's brilliant, right? What does it do with the other 23 and a half hours of its day? Wanders around, eats bugs, takes baths in the dirt. (laughs) All right? And he's like, but the whole time that that chicken is doing that, it's producing the next egg. Mm -hmm. Right? And so this must have been Brene Brown. So the idea here is that you have to give yourself that time. That time, that self-care, it doesn't, in my opinion, it doesn't remove you from productivity. It's necessary. I can't do a lot of the work that I do and create the content I create unless I'm thinking about it in the sauna. Yes. Or getting a massage or uh, taking my children fishing in the Clackamas River. Like mm. whatever those things are, like they're actually critically important to mm. the entire process. And I think we're missing that in the conversation about productivity. Yeah. Yeah. So all that said around self-care. Yeah. What are the things that do work for you? Mm. If we if we want to get if we want to get granular. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Yeah. My list my mm-hmm. Rolodex includes the following things. <laughs> Up, updating your Rolodex to new technology. Totally. Yeah, yeah maybe. <laughs> uh, cleaning my apartment and while my children are gone and then lying on the floor because it's spotless clean and listening to records. Okay. Okay. That's one of them. Okay. Wait. Pause. Yeah. Drop a record. Um, okay. Let's see. What is on my record? And you mean literally? Yeah. Vinyl. Yeah. Okay. I mean, it's Portland, Nick. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I got to get some vinyl in here. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> That'd be so cool if our clients could pick records to put on. I mean, I'll let, I'll let people pick whatever. Right. But like but an like, actual yeah. record, that'd be cool. What's on my, um, I think right now what I've been listening to is uh, Billie Holiday's Greatest Hits. I've okay. been jamming on that lately. Right. Pretty hardcore. Nice. Mm-hmm. Also, anything by Jenny Lewis. Okay. 
two um, things for me to check out. Yeah. Right. Mm-hmm. Um, so there's that one. Um, I also love going to movies. Yeah. I love movies. I love movie theaters. I love the Academy Movie Theater here in Portland. Okay. It's near and dear to my heart. Um, and sometimes that requires me going to a movie alone. That's not always the case, but sometimes I just really, because I'm a parent. Right, and so I'm I norm- love movies alone. <laughs> totally, I know. I'm always like taking my kids to movies, and they're like, blah blah. blah. There's no negotiation about where oh, to sit. My gosh. Oh my no one needs the restroom. Yeah, no nope. one needs the restroom. Yeah. Yeah. Um, um, I'm gonna pause for just yeah. a nerdy second and, yeah. and just assume you've seen the new Star Wars. Oh, <laughs> of course. Also, all of the Mandalorian, which I considered my own private Christmas gift just for me. Oh, yeah, it was good. It was my really uh, cool. my seven year olds. Um, uh, what's it called? Derby car yeah. for Cub Scouts. Mm-hmm. Baby Yoda. Oh, I love <laughs> Design. that. I mean, love that. We'll see how it comes out, but oh my gosh. we're working on it. Oh, yeah. totally. <laughs> oh, yeah. No, I'm big time into Star Wars, um, and so are my kids, which is a delight. Yeah, I'm glad we share that. They w- would say it's their favorite movie. I haven't seen it. Really? Yeah, because I've like steeped them in yeah. Star Wars culture. Like, sure. Their sheets are Star Wars. Awesome. They like. Yep. I had to explain that Darth Vader was like really bad. Yeah, he's so it's cool. a little ambiguous at this point, right? Like, like if you didn't grow he up, he looks cool to kids. Yeah. But like, well, and they've seen his full arc. Yeah. We didn't see yeah. that arc when we were kids. We That's were just like, true. that is a bad dude. Yes. Through and through. But yeah, they don't know. They, <laughs> they don't know the Anakin yeah. connection. I mean, they haven't even seen Episode Four yet. Right. But they'll be watching them in. Yeah. release date order yeah exactly yeah. of course they will <laughs> yeah i mean as a parent as a mother of daughters the this latest trilogy has been really incredible for me i mean oh, yeah. i never thought i would see a woman fly the millennium falcon oh yeah i real. actually burst into tears oh wow unexpectedly <laughs> when ray flew the millennium falcon that's awesome i just thought oh my gosh my whole life i've been waiting for this and they're not even gonna have to think twice and now you could go to disneyland and fly yourself apparently that's what they say well i'm going that's all there is to it yeah i will will, we we will literally talk about star wars for the rest of the podcast the podcast has been (laughs) (laughs) rebranded massage therapy dorks talk about star wars i don't think i've ever seen a star wars character receive body work Oh, so that's clearly missing from the Star it's Wars universe. Clearly missing, especially for, for stormtroopers. That yeah, looks I feel like, like they a lot should be getting like the they should be getting like stick and poke tattoos and massages. <laughs> 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 that's what it would be like if I was around. <laughs> <laughs> oh, so I've derailed your talk about your personal self care. Oh yeah, list. I if there's just, anything else you want to mention. Yeah, I mean, there's a bunch of things on there. Um, I mentioned saunas. I like to go to saunas. Um, Loyly Sauna here in Portland is incredible. Mm-hmm. Finnish sauna. North Portland. Mm-hmm. They actually have a northeast and a southeast location. Oh, they do. Mm-hmm. Um, I really like to pick a meal and cook it while listening to music and get into a flow state. Mm-hmm. Right. So that's really enjoyable for me. Um, I'm a fly fisherwoman, so okay. I like fishing. I like standing and moving water and fishing. Um, but honestly, sometimes these uh, things I'm mentioning are unattainable, either financially or time wise. So I also learned the power of um, centering on a smaller moment. Mm-hmm. So for that, that for me is making a really excellent cup of tea. Mm. That's great. And being completely present with it uh, to the point now where um, at the end of the ritual of making the cup of tea, I can put the teacup on the saucer and then turn it so the handle is where I need it. And the sound of that mm. is almost like a Pavlovian response for me. Wow. And I'll be like, oh, okay. So, yeah, I think it's important um, in that self-care conversation that we're not always talking about self-care that requires money or the resource of time. Right. Because what if you, all you have is a minute and a half while your kid is using the toilet? <laughs> you know, what are you going to do? <laughs> yeah. Okay, well, sometimes for me, that's like I'm going to make this cup of tea, but I'm going to be really present with it and... Um, gift it to myself yeah yeah those are incredible thoughts well on self-care. thank you I <laughs> had to learn it yeah let's see we've covered self-care oh i i wrote a note uh, during my research mm. this may have been me digging through your what is what are you meaning by or maybe it wasn't you international massage therapy oh yeah no, that, that's me that's a oh totally so do you just mean traveling to I, do massage other places i mean i mean the work of identifying it Go on. Yeah, right? (laughs) I will. (laughs) Thanks for asking about it. Um, Every single culture has an approach to body work, Mm -hmm. right? Every single culture. 
So I think like something that really brought in my mind to this idea is the first time that I understood that other people, like people outside of the United States, actually refer to American style massage. Like, let me ask you, if somebody said to you, Nick, tell me what American style massage is, what would you even say? I, yeah, I guess I would say we just co-opted Swedish mas- yeah. massage and like m- made it yeah. our own thing. I know, right? Yeah. Not weird. What do what? So it depends the in, in yeah. the different. It depends oh. on the place, right? So um, years ago, when I was still married, uh, my my husband and I were thinking about um, taking the kids to live in France for a while. Okay. Um, I lived in Western Belgium for a little bit when I was younger, and so I've always wanted to go back. So um, and I love to research. So one of my phases of research for that was I joined a Facebook group for American expatriates. Mm-hmm. So expats, right? Meaning right. people from one culture living in another culture. Mm-hmm. Um, so I joined this Facebook group. And I just put out a message like, hey, everyone. Hello, fellow Americans living in Paris. Um, I'm a massage therapist. And I'm thinking about spending some time living in Paris. Is there a need for a massage? Like, what do you think? I was inundated. Oh, really? Inundated. By responses, and the responses all had the tone of, oh my gosh, I miss American massage therapy. Interesting. And so I had to ask, what is American massage therapy? And these Americans living in Paris identified it as massage on a table. Okay. And very much like a deep tissue Swedish fusion. Okay. Right. Yeah. I they guess were, I'm an American massage therapist. It, <laughs> true story. I guess we both are. Yeah. But can you imagine like how that shifted my perception? Yeah. I was like, right. I have to look at not just my fishbowl, but like the whole thing. Also, um, I've learned a lot about Twina, which is Chinese massage. Sure. And something that we look about or we look at in like the research of things is like, what is the conduit or what I like to call the pinch point? between an entire culture or a body of study and then ours, right? Like where did those two things connect? And usually what we do with massage is we trace it through the teachers because there's very much like an oral lineage or like a showing people how to do things. And that's all right, but it's also complicated, right? Because everyone has their own bias. Everyone has their own background. And so the majority of Chinese massage I've learned was through Maria Mercati, which rest in peace. She passed away um, not that long ago and an incredible teacher. Um, But the truth is, is that I learned Chinese massage from a white woman, I think from the UK. Oh, and so that's going to change the perspective. Absolutely. Should we not be asking like, what does that mean? Right. Yeah. I got off on a tangent. Yeah, no, that's incredible. So part of the, the long-term, um, mission of mm-hmm. massage hodgepodge as a as an entity as a yeah. community anyway is to bring long form body work on, on video mm-hmm. to everyone yeah so people can watch it and and like so just everyday people might watch it and actually like receive benefit yes it might be just be relaxing to watch yeah a, a therapist at work yeah um other you know as other body workers, we could collaborate and say yep. like, oh, what, what technique is this here? Yep. Maybe you could try this differently or you yep. could get feedback. Absolutely. Um, but my hope is that over time, I might, it, I'll take it on the road so that oh, I totally. can, so that I can bring the yes. world yes. Thai massage from Thailand. Exactly. You know, and, and, or so, so yeah. one of my, like, I'm just going to jam on this because this Please. is like one of my yeah. favorite topics. First of all, a lot of us massage therapists are travel motivated. Mm-hmm. We are people who tend to like to be nomadic and travel. Um, So that's been very true. I've seen that in all my years of teaching. Um, God, I have so much to say about this. Um, (laughs) It's interesting, too. People get stuck a little bit on the licensing, right? So for people who aren't massage therapists, they might not know that our professional licenses Mm -hmm. um, in the United States of America, for the most part, are issued by the state. Mm -hmm. So you and I are licensed in Oregon. That doesn't mean that we could go to... New York and work. We certainly couldn't because they actually have a higher educational requirement Mm. than Oregon. And then it gets even more complicated on the international stage, Mm. right? Because now like in Belgium, it's called, it's not called massage therapist. I think it's called physiotherapist or something like that. Right. So there's a translation issue in terms of just scope of practice. But beyond that, I think there's no problem with translation because it's ancient. 
Right. Right. So an example I have of this is like most of us have learned cupping. Have you learned cupping? I haven't yet. Yeah. I almost feel pure pressure to learn it now. It is a thing. Yeah. It is a thing right now. In particular, fire cupping, which most of the fire cupping I've seen, and um, this might be incorrect, but most of what I've seen, my understanding is it's coming from Eastern traditions, Mm -hmm. which is cool. Um, But I was looking through the ethnographic record for the Sami people in Northern Scandinavia. They're like a herding culture. Um, and so anthropologists had done this medical anthropology where they had gone in and just recorded like all of their medical practices. They have been fire cupping with reindeer antler for thousands of years. Wow. Reindeer antler. Reindeer antler. Fascinating. And I was like, oh, I thought cupping was just from, you know, China or certain Middle Eastern cultures have it too. Yeah. And so that to me is like what I get really excited about when we're talking about what you're saying, like put content out there, start collaborating because that conversation is so important and potent. And in my opinion, it's just ready to happen. Yeah. Yeah. There's also a a university of Oslo in Norway they're linked with the World Health Organization, and they are doing this really interesting research study now about like the intersection between modern medicine and what they call traditional folk medicine. Okay. Right, and like body work is part of that. Mm. So the WHO is funding research in it right now, and then like we're gonna come along with our videos and like, hey, I have something to say about that, yeah. or I want to help facilitate connection around that. I want to yeah. learn from everyone. Yeah. Yeah. Um, for your part, do you think you could, would you be comfortable re- recorded? I've, I've gotten both. Oh, oh, you mean video? Yeah. Oh yeah, absolutely. Yeah. Well, Some people are like, oh, I don't want to be on camera to do a session. Yeah. And you got to find a right client, obviously. That's Someone true. Who's to be on I guess for me, I've had experience with it because okay. being a teacher in the classroom. Right. That makes sense. Um, I always, almost always have a student who wants to record my demos. Oh, right. Um, and so I just always ask them to please not put it on the internet, but I figure it's only a matter of time Yeah. until that happens. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, yeah I'm all right with it. Yeah. I don't really love watching myself. Yeah. You know, that's its own emotional work. But I guess I believe in sharing the information enough that I'm yeah. willing to sit with I that just, discomfort. Um, I recorded a, a session recently, and, and it was just so instructive. This is from mm-hmm. a practitioner, mm-hmm. um, Karen with Mew Massage in in the Beaverton area. Mm -hmm. And she's like 22 years of experience. I was just like, yeah, I learned so much just from what it was incredible. When you watch a master, like master level. Yeah. There's something to that. Yeah. I was like, I need to rewatch it and take that. Cause I was like filming, you know, I was like, I just like, you know, all these, my mind was being blown the whole time. I was like, yep. I had no idea. Yeah. That was neat. Yeah. Yeah. And it's interesting for me as a teacher to try to translate that level of, expertise and break it down yeah. into digestible educational yeah. chunks. Well, I'm excited to forward some of these videos to your students yeah. cuz totally. they're so cool. Yeah. I had this uh, this notion for a while. I thought it'd be cool to to be able to get a massage from a master yeah. while watching them give it to you. Oh, that would So be cool. I was trying to figure out how to like yeah. be able to Port look through the, face, the cradle, face cradle through the face cradle <laughs> At a screen that's giving you a live feed yeah. of them working yeah. on you. I'm yeah. still. It's fascinating. I'm still. Because so I mean, many I times. I definitely feel like that might remove you from some of the. The benefit. Like the parasympathetic response. But as an educational. As a. Th- yes. For a thing for. Because so many times I've been in a session where I've been like. What, what are, are they, they doing? doing? <laughs> that's true. You're like, is that an elbow? I is just, that a knuckle? Yeah. Is that the, a foot? Yeah. I don't know. What is happening? Yeah, yeah. totally. Yeah. Yeah. So, that's a cool idea. Yeah. Well, I guess you could get the same benefit by yeah. watching it after. But to yeah. know in the moment when it, yeah. You know, and before we move on from this topic of international yeah. massage, I have, to, I have to bring this up. Um, I really wanted to take a group of students for it last year, but it didn't work out. Um, but I want people to know about this. So there is now every year an international massage competition oh, yes. in Copenhagen, Denmark. Yes, the, the therapist in question that I just mentioned. Yeah. She participated in that last year. She did. Yeah. That's so cool. It's definitely becoming more well-known, which I think is awesome. It is, on the surface level, a weird idea. Oh, my gosh. It's literally a juxtaposition to say massage and competition in the same sentence. Yes. It has a level of absurdity. But the idea of raising awareness overall is a great thing. Yeah. Well, here's, here's how I feel about it. Sure, it raises awareness overall, but what I get excited about is... 
in what other situation would you find yourself spending a weekend with massage therapists from every part of the world? Right. It's literally what I've been talking about. Yeah. You know, I want to go not just to compete, but to meet everyone. Yeah. And be like, I would want to go just to film all day and watch. Yeah. Yeah. What are you doing? Look at that. Look at this. Look at that. And then walk away with, you know, a series of contacts. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. So another really important thing for me to ask you about, especially knowing now that you consult yes, and you help people understand the business side. Absolutely. So, okay. But actually maybe these will dovetail. Yeah. Doing this, this project, this process, this podcast, this I mean, this practice, mm-hmm. basically my entire new life. Yeah. I sometimes succumb and suffer from imposter syndrome. Oh, totally. So yeah. Yep. I've been, yep. I, I was a massage therapist. I graduated in 2010 right. from East West College. Right. And practiced for about three years. Yeah. The boys, the my first son was born. Yeah. I started doing uh, marketing for my now ex-wife's yep. dental office. Yep. Stopped being a massage therapist. Yep. It's inactive. Totally. I've been away. Yep. So I almost feel like I'm brand new. Totally. And I feel like I'm out here talking about it. And like, yeah. who am I to yeah. to to be the one, the voice right. of this? Right. You know, so I'm just trying to be curious and be open and bring yes. and experts be brave. like yourself. Be and, brave. Yeah. So I, I'm sure you have thoughts about I have imposter so, syndrome. I have so many thoughts about this. I love this. it. First of all, imposter syndrome is the great unifier. Okay. I don't know anybody who hasn't felt it, right? But we tend to not talk about it. Mm-hmm. And it's shame-based, so that's from Brene Brown right oh, there. Oh, sure. Um, but a couple different thoughts about imposter syndrome. Um, well, I just recently saw a meme or something on, on we Instagram. We can learn everything we need to know from yes. memes. Yes, in fact, I think I put it in my <laughs> Instagram stories, and it said something to, to the effect of, we should all be brave enough to do a new thing imperfectly. Mm. I loved that. Because something that I think about, and I had a teacher hand me this concept years ago, which is, um, okay, let's, uh, let's run it through its worst possible scenario, right? Yeah. So you try a thing, and it crashes and burns, mm-hmm. okay? Um, you're, you should still celebrate that. And when I heard that, I was like, what, why would you celebrate failure? Right. And the idea behind it was like, you know what? It's so easy to just stay in your cozy little den and never poke your head out and never try a thing. So if you have poked your head out and you put a thing out into the world and you tried it and it didn't work, you should still be rewarding yourself. Because in some ways, it's so much easier to not try. Yeah. So that really changed my feeling. Yeah. It really like empowered me to go like, yeah, this is awesome. And what I tell my students, and I've even done this for myself, uh, when I fail, like, because failure is one of the most profound learning tools. Sure. You will learn so much faster, often through failure, yep. than success. And so I literally have created uh, print out awards for myself. No, I'm, I'm not even joking. Nick. Like I will fail at a thing and then print a certificate for myself. Congratulations, Crystal. You did this thing and you failed spectacularly at it. And I'll have a little ritual around it, you know, like, and be like, yeah, yay me. Like it kind of sucks, but I want to stay focused on the fact that I'm still putting stuff out into the world. Um, another thought about this is, um, and this is maybe an unpopular opinion, but if you don't have haters, <laughs> uh-huh. if you don't have people who just don't like you, um, you're maybe not putting enough stuff out there. Yeah. Right. And so I had another mentor who was like, uh, I had my first super negative feedback um, and it was like really hard emotionally. As an educator or as a As therapist? an educator. Okay. Mm-hmm. Um, as a therapist, that's different for me because I feel like so much goes into a good therapeutic fit that mm-hmm. I tend to not take it personally. Yes. If somebody doesn't like my style. A whole but this topic, was yes. yeah, but this was something that I like created and put out into the world and somebody was like, That person is like way too full of herself or like this or that. It was it really leaned right on the imposter syndrome. Um, and I was crying and I was so upset about it. And this mentor said to me, Hey, congratulations. And I, I was like, I'm sorry, what? And she's like, Welcome to your first hater. Mm. You did it. You put enough content out into the world that someone disagreed with you. Yeah. Good job. Yeah. And, and that was just monumental. And then the last thing I'll say about it comes from one of my favorite teachers. Um, I mean, I've never met him in person, but Seth Godin. Oh, sure. 
podcast called Akimbo. Um, yeah. His book, This Is Marketing, is, is hugely profound for me. Um, he said in a podcast recently about imposter syndrome, if you don't feel uncomfortable, you're not doing the right thing, mm. basically. Something like if you feel uncomfortable, if you feel imposter syndrome, that is a breadcrumb that you're on the right trail. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. And I agree with that. So these are all um, tools I've put into my toolkit to deal with the discomfort because I'm not above it. Yeah. It still happens to me. I think it probably happens to most people the majority of their lifetime. Yeah. And so rather than try to um, avoid it altogether, because I think that's fairly impossible, right. it's really like, okay, well, how can we transmute it? So when we're feeling it, we're able to say, oh, cool, I'm on the right path. Yeah. This is a good sign. Awesome. Yeah. You did have a lot of thoughts about I that. do. I have So a lot what of I started asking about you about, and then <laughs> yeah. I got sidetracked because I wanted to know about that is um, what does your work look like as a business coach? What yep. are, so I am, um, st- I just started Massage Hodgepodge, this, yep. this, which is also a, a location in Portland, Oregon. Yep. It's a, a, an actual clinical practice. Yep. And I've done a lot of work around the brand and, yeah, and the social media, across. and I'm creating these videos, yep. we're doing this podcast, but yep. none of that specifically leads people in the door, right, right. which I'm starting to wake up to the going back to a little old school and yep. getting out there into the community. Yep. I've been Meeting doing a lot people. of that work yep. more recently, but yep. thoughts about practice building, about approach practice to building. business in general. Yeah. Um, so, okay, let's talk about practice building. So um, there's a lot of things that go into practice building. Um, I do think that our field is very curious in the fact that um, trusted referrals seem to be the best driver of business, mm-hmm. meaning that... Um, let's say somebody is in your neighborhood and they decide that they want a massage, they can just Google whatever massage therapists are around and maybe that drives business. But what's really going to drive business is they're at dinner with a friend Mm -hmm. and they say, "Mm, I'm really thinking about, you know, seeing a massage therapist. And that friend is like, you know who you need to see? You need to see Nick. Yeah. I see Nick. Nick is great. That right there. That's gold. Gold. Right. Right. But you need to, you've got to, get exactly those people to start with yeah you have yeah. to hit and that's that like base threshold maybe where it comes back to like i don't know i mean there's so many different opinions about different groupons yeah. and offers and strategies and this oh and i have that. so yeah. many opinions about yeah. that i really do and so another thing i think about is um i have some magical thinking around money okay okay um and i've talked to a lot of business owners about this not just in massage but um If you can find a way financially to alleviate the money pressure on your private practice, I think it stands a chance of growing in a really organic, beautiful way that's scalable Mm long-term. So what this looked like for me, let me give you an example. So I'm being a little ethereal there. Yeah. When I started my private practice, which I did as soon as I got licensed, I've had it from the beginning. Obviously, I didn't have any clients. I was losing money on it Mm -hmm. Um, but I also went to work at the same time as a massage therapist for someone else right so that I could pay the bills Mm -hmm. and then that gave me the freedom to build my private practice meticulously in the image I wanted it in Mm -hmm. because I wasn't chasing the money right Um, now of course that's not going to be the case for everybody that was a fairly privileged position to be in I didn't have kids Mm. at that time and so it was really easy to like work a bunch Mm -hmm. in all different directions. So I really want to make sure I'm like acknowledging, right? That that's not going to be an option for everyone. Um, But what I was able to do was build up a core group of phenomenal clients, many of whom are still with me. Oh, wow. Who don't bat an eye at the cost. Mm -hmm. They don't need to be led to the understanding that massage therapy is important. Mm -hmm. Um, They're just like dream clients. And they probably continue to refer to you. Exactly. Yeah. Um, and it took time that probably took, I think about two years Yeah. before I felt like I was at that point. Yeah. Yeah. So yeah, connecting with people, um, something that really helped me for connecting in the beginning. And I tell people to try this is find the business association for your neighborhood. Already in it. Join it. <laughs> Go to the meetings. Yep. Offer to get up and talk to the group. I mean, 
if you are okay with that, I also understand that not everybody is okay yeah. with public speaking, and that's all right, too. Yeah. But if you are, and you can get up and you can address the group, that's great. So I got so many wonderful referrals from the business owners in my neighborhood, and I don't even do business in that neighborhood anymore, but I still have those contacts. It's been mm. wonderful. That's great. Yeah, so that, just get really active. Um, and then if you have the resource of time. Yeah. Right. So this is, I, I know I've said this a bunch. This is something I tell my students, my catchphrase. This is something I tell my students. Uh, when you first graduate from massage school or you're first starting out again, mm -hmm. right, um, it can be so easy to panic about the lack of clients because we need money to survive, of right, course. Right. However, if all you do is panic about that, you lose sight of the fact that you have a beautiful resource of time. Mm-hmm. I don't have that resource anymore. I'm so busy, like all the time. You right. Know? Um, and so I really challenge people to remember that that is a powerful, valuable resource and then say to you, what are you doing with it? Yeah. What are you doing with it? Because there's no shortage of events that need massage therapists, right? Mm -hmm. To show up and like give chair massage and meet people and like hand out business cards. And there's all sorts of things you could be doing like that. Um, that's time well spent. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Those are good. I also have strong feelings about pricing and practice building. Do you want to talk about that? Sure. Yeah. Yeah. Let's talk about that. I would love to hear your thoughts about okay. that. So um, I think it's really lost on a lot of folks that um, because we live in a capitalist culture and we live in America, uh, that the amount of money you charge for massage indicates a value whether you want it to or not. Okay. So what I see happening a lot is people will start out and they'll start with a deeply discounted rate. Sure. And they think that's going to drive business. Um, I have an example of this. Um, when I first started out, I was in this building. It was I had a private practice and this other colleague of mine had a private practice. I started out at full market rate at that point for Portland, which was $65 an hour. Mm -hmm. um, this person started out at 45 an hour. Mm-hmm. <clears throat> Um, as a standard rate. Yep, as a standard rate. Ongoing. Not, it was not like a special. It wasn't a discount. Okay. That was the rate. And it was hard for me to watch at first because she was so busy. Yeah. Like her books were solid. Yeah. And mine were not, right? I'm still going to work for other people and like building as we go along. And then we get a year in and I'm catching up to her. I'm not as busy as her, but mm -hmm. I'm getting there. Let's say I'm like 65, 70% booked. Mm -hmm. She starts burning out. Mm. she's like I can't do this many massages in a week it's time to raise my rates and I'm like yeah do it she raised her rate to market rate the client attrition was so small so she had attracted a particular type of exactly client that wanted the low price overall more right. than the Ex relationship 100% Nick exactly more than the therapeutic relationship right mm -hmm. they were just you know and and that's okay but that's that kind of client like they're looking for that deal and so yeah when she raised her rates it was shocking to her how many clients didn't stay with her yeah because she thought well we've built up this great therapeutic relationship and they really enjoy working with me well maybe that was true but they also really enjoyed a massage at a deep discount yeah and so you really have to ask yourself what is this scalable product i'm building mm -hmm. and also like what am i communicating to clients when I list my pricing and what kind of client do I want to attract to me? Right. You know, so for me also, I think it's really important practice building to visualize your ideal client. Yeah. This sounds so woo woo, but yeah. it's very, no, helpful. I've heard this over and over again. Oh yes. You yeah. need to visualize or, or there can be multiple ones. It doesn't have to be one person. Mm -hmm. This also for me leads into marketing. I market from that place yeah. of visualizing the person first um, but visualize that. And for me, it's somebody who um, has the resources and the time and the understanding. Now, that said, and I don't know if we have time to get into this today, but I think also an important part of this conversation, though, is talking about privilege and access and who has access to body work. Yeah. Right. Um, because what I also see is a lot of people who say, yeah, but it really bothers me that marginalized populations can't get massage. So I'm going to offer like this deep sliding scale. Right. Uh, to which I say, I think we should probably be organizing something to help people have access to massage, mm -hmm. right? Like I would prefer if my colleagues were working less and getting paid really well mm -hmm. for that time. And then we have additional time and resources to have that conversation mm. around access. Mm -hmm. 
Um, and this all ties into, I've just, I've just seen it in the last decade and a half. I've seen so many great massage therapists burn out energetically and emotionally. Yeah. Well, I'm only charging $45, but I don't want to raise my rates because I want to make sure everybody can have access to massage, so on and so forth. But I don't think that that's a problem that we solve individually. Yeah. Just in our private practice. Mm. Also truly becoming single mom it really sobered me up to the idea of like, if I'm going to be at work, I have to make this amount of money mm-hmm. while I'm here. Right. That's all there is to it. I have small people who are depending on me. Yeah, for sure. Um, but I do think it's overdue um, that we as an industry start looking at who has access to massage and finding ways to reach marginalized populations. Yeah. Yeah. Removing that financial barrier. Uh-huh. Because if massage really is for everyone, like, what are we doing about it? Right. Yeah. Yeah. That's a good point. Yeah. Wow. I have a lot of thoughts. There's so much in here. I know. I can't even. <laughs> it's incredible. <laughs> well, it's uh, it seems like once this podcast is... Um, <laughs> Uh, out for a while. I think yeah. you should have you come back yeah. for a round two or a round table. Yeah, absolutely. We'll figure out a, a, a topic you can yeah. contribute to. There's so many to choose from. Yes. Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. So yeah. tell the world, uh, such as it is, all of my tens of subscribers. <laughs> <laughs> Hello, all ten of you. <laughs> um, uh, where they might um, encounter you. I don't know. If oh, you're, sure. I don't even know if you're, you're, you're seek new clients still. Sometimes yeah. I have a waiting list that okay. people are certainly welcome to add themselves to. Um, I think you asked me earlier what my private practice looks like. Um, yeah. At this point, it's actually only one day a week. Okay. Yeah, by referral only. So what you're not going to find for me right now is a super snazzy website. Mm-hmm. Um, most of my online presence at this point is actually on Instagram, which okay. has been kind of fascinating yeah. for me. Um, so my Instagram handle is Crystal Kalanka LMT. Okay. Um, you can find me there and message me there for sure. Um, a lot of the content that I'm talking about is on there. Um, so yeah, that's where they can find me. Also, um, I'm on faculty at East West College of Missa- East West College of the Healing Arts. Yes. Here in Portland, Oregon. Wonderful. Um, and so yeah, you can find me there too. Those are awesome. my two primary places. And then um, I also I do like discussion groups um, and groups that get together to talk about like research. Um, something I think a lot about is. Um, we as massage therapists don't really necessarily get a lot of training in um, research grants, case studies, and mm. also critical dissection of those oh, studies. Yeah. Um, and so I have little groups on that too that I lead. Just like let's take a look at this research study and like jam on it and talk about it and see what we think. Um, and if an if an a practitioner wanted to reach out to you about uh, business coaching yeah, consulting totally. through Instagram again. Yep, exactly. Or they can, I mean, my phone number is attached to that. They can okay. also like call, text, or email. But yeah, I offer uh, coaching cool. <clears throat> for individuals or small groups. Um, and that can be anything from the body mechanics that sure. we were referencing earlier yeah. to um, practice building, to making shifts culturally in what they're doing. So yeah, that's become the thing that I love doing the most at this point in time is helping people with their professional development. Incredible. Yeah. Well, Crystal Kalanka, thank you so much for yeah. being on the Massage Hodge podcast. Thank you so much for having me. And to everyone listening, 